fantastic finale to a tremendous event, uh, not just in uh, St. Petersburg history or Tampa Bay history or even American history, but world history. And I get goosebumps when I just think, think of this. I'm very passionate about what I do and I have a great love for um, making things and the problem solving. And, you know, to, to do something that has historical significance like this is, is a real honor. I am absolutely blown away. When you think about the amount of effort funding the donors, the volunteers, the design professionals, the craftsmen, the fabricators that put all of this together, it's absolutely mind-boggling. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience to have been a part of something like this. On this very spot, back in 1914, New Year's Day, something incredible happened that changed aviation history and would change the world. I'm Will Michaels. I'm the president of Flight 2014, Inc., which is the sponsoring organization for the world's first airline monument. January 1st, 1914, New Year's Day was a lot more than New Year's Day here in St. Petersburg. It was an absolutely spectacular uh, occasion for the city. You had a crowd of 3,000 people turn out to see the world's first airline take its first flight uh, across the bay. You know, a lot of people had never even seen a plane before. They didn't know what an airplane was. I mean, this was totally uh, new to them. They'd heard about it, no doubt, and maybe even seen a picture, but to see an actual airplane, that would have been a rare thing for a lot of people that were in that crowd of uh, 3,000 people. The principals in the first airline, uh, Tom Benoit, obviously the manufacturer, Percy Fansler, the uh, fellow who, the engineer who came up with the idea of having an airline, uh, Mayor File, uh, who was not only the first uh, passenger in the first airline, but he was a marvelous mayor of uh, St. Petersburg, uh, really did a lot for the city, a lot for the city's infrastructure. Uh, and then, of course, Tony Janus, chief pilot uh, of the airline. Tony Janus was a hero, an aviation hero in his day. He had uh, uh, altitude uh, records. He, had, uh, he was the pilot who uh, flew uh, Albert Berry for the uh, first parachute jump. Uh, he had long distance over water uh, records. So he was uh, right up there with all the other Beachley and all the other great names of that uh, early pioneer uh, aviation uh, time. On top of that, uh, he was uh, a great aviator a student of uh, aviation. He was uh, an expert uh, on aviation and he brought a lot to that world's first airline. One of the curiosities uh, of the occasion actually was that Will Rogers, the uh, humorist, uh, was actually in the crowd. Uh, he was performing rope tricks for a circus. So it was an absolutely fantastic occasion. You had the auction, of course, uh, with uh, Mayor File uh, winning that uh, auction to be the first passenger. The money that was raised went for Harbor Light, so it was a charity uh, auction. He paid 400 bucks, which was a fortune. I mean, that was like $7,000 in 1914 uh, to be that first uh, passenger there. By virtue of being the director of the museum, I was also a member of the Tony Janus Society, which is celebrated the uh, world's first airline and the uh, pilot of the world's first air airline, Tony Janus, uh, since the 1960s. And uh, what we did was we formed an umbrella uh, organization. Flight 2014 obviously was named after the centennial year of the world's first airline. Uh, so uh, we've got these uh, three or four organizations uh, to come together, Janus Society, Florida Aviation Historical Society, the museum, uh, the chamber also, and we formed this uh, umbrella uh, not-for-profit. So out of that, um, the, the monument idea uh, evolved. We worked closely with the city, of course, uh, for the centennial celebration. We had uh, Paul Stelrick was the liaison between the city and uh, the uh, Flight 2014 uh, umbrella organization. He uh, brought to our attention 
that, you know, uh, the monument that we did have at that time, it was a monument that was put up uh, back in 1938 and looked kind of like a giant uh, tombstone. And then about that same time, we got together with uh, Ed Montanari, uh, Chris Davis, and Ron Whitney. Uh, they all came up with the same idea that, you know, that we need to have a better uh, monument to the World's Fairest Airline than what we've had out there for the past, you know, since 1938. I'm Ed Montaneri. I'm, a, I'm the chairman of the St. Petersburg City Council, an airline pilot and a former fighter pilot. It's a great story. I, I got a call from a friend of mine, Chris Davis, and he wanted to have breakfast with me and uh, to talk about uh, a, a concept that was given to him. One of our employees in our marketing department, his name's Ron Whitney, and he had this idea to create a walkway to a little piece of playground equipment that looked like uh, the Benoit airboat. Uh, so Chris and I had breakfast, he showed me the plans, and I liked what I saw, uh, except for the piece of playground equipment. I thought we could do a lot better. I went to college at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and I had visited there a couple years earlier with my son. And in front of the university is a metal replica of the Wright Flyer. And I just happened to ha have my iPad with me and I showed Chris Davis that picture and I said, instead of the piece of playground equipment, we should build something like this. He saw it and he goes, that's what we need to do. So my job was kind of dealing with the government side of, of the problem along with the fundraising. We passed a resolution, which uh, it passed unanimously, and we had the mayor and city council on board. Legal was working on the legal challenges, and uh, we were off. The vision was to uh, locate the monument at a historically accurate site. And the site that the monument's located at is where the first hangar was for the first airline. Will Michaels and I and uh, some of our Parks and Recs people kind of went out to that site and there wasn't much out there. In the meantime, while all this is going on, we're, we're in the planning process and the construction process of uh, the new pier. So there is a lot of like things happening all at once. And we wanted, just like Ron Whitney envisioned, a walkway to a, a piece of art. One of the principals in all of this is uh, Phil Graham, Philip Graham. Uh, and also his dad, Phil Graham, was very involved in this uh, in the beginning. The Graham family knows our waterfront extremely well. Uh, understands how much we value the waterfront here in St. Petersburg. And they jumped in uh, and were just very supportive and put a lot of time and effort in pro bono work when it comes to the site, designing it and uh, making it this special site in so many different ways. My name is Phil Graham. I'm managing principal of Phil Graham Landscape Architecture and we're the lead designers for the Benoit Plaza. My great-grandfather was a postman in St. Petersburg before World War I, and he was well known. I like to think that he was there that day to watch the Benoit take off. And I like to think that my contribution to this project is a tribute to him. We knew early on there was no location for the monument. They wanted to put it near the museum, and there was some open field on the pier but it was really up in the air. We started with the idea of a simple circle. Ron Whitney had created an early rendering in 2015 of what the plaza and the sculpture might look like. We took that idea and began to look at ways we could interpret the event through storytelling within a plaza that could work in many locations. Once we found out that the city was going to allow us to put the sculpture on the original historical site. Well, that was a game changer. That became incredibly exciting. We have a lot of talented artists here in the city of St. Petersburg, and we wanted, first of all, it needed to be a quality piece, uh, but we wanted a uh, local artist to do it. And, and Mark was just a uh, hands down choice to, to make this special piece happen. Mark Ailing uh, just kind of jumped out at, at us as being the, the best uh, sculptor, the best artist uh, within the Tampa Bay area. And he's not just a Tampa Bay area artist, he's a nationally known uh, artist. And uh, we just, it, it was, you know, chemistry. <laughs> we, we knew this was the guy. I'm Mark Ailing. 
and I am a sculptor and owner and operator of MGA Sculpture Studio and I created the monument for the first flight. A lot of people have these pie in the eye ideas and I've been approached many times to um, help them realize that idea or at least the concept for that. And initially I thought, you know, I'll talk to these guys about this and most likely it's not going to happen. I think I, I probably bid it conceptually two or three times over a, a five-year period and then um, I was approached uh, after I thought the project had gone away um, they got a, a very significant donation that put them over the top and they were ready to pull the trigger on the project. You know there would be months when we wouldn't get a, a, a financial, the financial support uh, that we needed uh, but uh, we never gave up on it. If it was not for the McManus uh, contribution, it was the contribution that put us over the top. Champagne corks were being <laughs> released into the air. As the lead designer of the project, it was our responsibility to put together a design team that was made up of talented professionals in our area that have a history here, that have spent their careers serving St. Petersburg. So with the assistance of Karen's engineering, providing the structural design for the plane, Griner engineering, providing our electrical design for the lighting, and with Hennessy Construction, providing construction services, we had a stellar design team and construction team that worked closely with the city and the foundation to bring all of this together. All of the engineering for the monument was provided by Karen's Engineering, but Karen's, the founder of Karen's Engineering personally, uh, did a lot of the, uh, the work. Uh, hundreds, probably thousands of uh, calculations were made. Uh, uh, the, the, the backup <laughs> work is, you know, like that, uh, that thick. Uh, and uh, he uh, just uh, did a fantastic job, and all of his services were provided uh, uh, pro bono. The goal was always to make the airplane as accurate as contemporary engineering concerns would allow. So the design was the design of the airplane. The, the real design part of it from a sculptural perspective was the technical design. How do we make this thing that was built out of silk and wood out of stainless steel so that it still looks like the original airplane can withstand the winds, won't want to take off in a hurricane. Um, so that became the real design criteria and that's where there, were, there was a lot of creative problem solving in how to keep it as authentic as possible. This was all made even more complicated because the original drawings were lost. So we were piecing information together from historical records, documentation. There were two replicas that had been made over time of this airplane, and both of those groups that made those replicas had done a bunch of research. And it was really interesting to gather up all that information and learn where the discrepancies between the different teams were, then the historical research that we did to try and capture uh, as much information as possible so that we could get it as accurate as possible. And it really became a passion at that point. Um, myself and my lead designer, Alex Kaufman, um, got somewhat obsessed about this notion of trying to make it as accurate as we could. And it became sort of uh, an exercise in historical research and data and processing all that information. All of the problem solving happens right here in the computer clear down to um, you know a thousandth of an inch we can we can get uh, an accuracy in what we can cut and how we're going to fabricate so what we have to do is then match what's happening here on the computer with real materials in real space my lead designer alex did some really deep dives into the internet and found some remote websites in fact uh, tony janice ended up passing in russia and there was a lot of documentation on Russian websites about the first flight and who would have thought, but we found some really interesting photographs just from digging through the wonderful thing that is the internet. We took all that information together and even went so far as to 
reproduce the lens uh, distortion from the photographs and, and trying to figure out what kind of cameras were shooting those early images um, so that we would have a better idea of what kind of distortion we were getting and then doing layovers with the three-dimensional object that, that we had generated in the computer with those original shots. So it was a, a very painstaking process, very time consuming, but uh, definitely done with a lot of passion. What it comes down to is a combination of structural engineering, and, um, and technical design and uh, a lot of time and consideration and playing through things over and over again. You know, when, when we ran the first round of calculations um, in order to get the, the wind load capacity that we needed in those wing structures, I mean, keep in mind, this plane never flew over, I think, 60 miles an hour, top speed and uh, it was never intended for wind any more than that. It was a very, very light weight. I mean, that was the whole point, is to make it as light as possible. Um, you know, you could take a poker and shove it right through those wings. They were, they were, they were silk with a hardener on them. And um, when we start dealing with these heavy materials, enough to, to handle a hurricane force wind, how do you keep it? looking accurate. We worked as accurately as possible to the original dimensions of the plane. The wingspan is 45 feet and the uh, height of the monument as it currently sits is right around 28 feet and then the full length of the airplane I believe is between 22 and 25 feet. The, the monument weighs 16,000 pounds. 16,000 pounds of stainless steel. The thing that really complicated everything was this notion we had early on to make it look a little more dynamic. We tipped the wings 10 degrees from side to side and five degrees back. And we thought that that would make a really dynamic uh, sculpture, make it look a little bit more like it was in flight or in movement. And at that point in time, we didn't realize the level of complexity that that would add to the design because that basing element, that pylon that holds it up, when we tip that piece like that, all of a sudden all the connection points, those connection points are no longer bilaterally symmetrical. And when we're dealing with four inch uh, square tube with a 3 8 inch wall that's all stainless steel, um, it's incredibly heavy, incredibly difficult to fabricate with. So instead of being a really simple truss structure, it became this really complex series of uh, obscure angles. And that complicated the fabrication project more than we realized. So I've, I've been making figures for a long time and it's a, it's a passion of mine, figurative sculpture. So um, the, the way that whole process starts is doing a deep dive into the historic reproduction of and gathering of information. So, there was a very specific moment from a famous photograph that we were trying to reproduce. So we pulled up as many different iterations of that moment and there was more than one photograph taken. Um, but uh, Tony Janis is waving at the camera with his left hand actually, which became very significant to how all this evolved. Mayor File is sitting next to him. The first step is to reproduce the anatomy, the, the basic pose of those figures. So I do what's called turnarounds and I have a rotating base and um, have a stationary camera and we use a long lens and we, um, we, we shorten that focal length so we're flattening that image plane as much as possible. And then we shoot a series of, of shots rotating a model, in this case it was me who modeled for both of them in different costume, to capture the anatomy, the structure of those poses as much as possible. And then, once again, it's a deep dive into Google and um, historical research into information uh, and as many photographs as we could find and we tapped all the resources that we could. The family, the file family uh, is, is still alive and well in the, in the city of St. Petersburg. Mayor File had a really great nose. I remember really enjoying carving his nose. And Tony Janis just had this life to him. He was this incredibly viva vivacious guy. Virtually every photograph of him, he's got this giant smile on his face. You can tell he's one of these guys that was just very um, gregarious, larger than life character. 
the sculpture of the Benoit airboat is just one component of this monument. And the, the monument in, in the, the, the consideration of the greater plaza and all of the histori historical components and materials that are used were all designed, developed, conceptualized by Phil Graham. In a way, the groundbreaking was a big sigh of relief because a lot of the work had been behind us and we were able to breathe for a moment and enjoy the progress we had made knowing that we had a very solid design in place. Once the groundbreaking was over, we had to get to work. That's when a lot of the hard work began. So for us, we knew we had kind of a triangular site. We actually were working with uh, the seawall that's been there since the time of the uh, historic event took place, that corner out there. So we're right in the location where the hangar was built and where we were able to historically kind of uh, tell the story of the events that took place for those months where they actually ran this plane. I can tell you that there was a lot of consideration that went into how the airboat would be positioned in the plaza. And ultimately what was landed upon was to, to have it face the actual flight took off in. Now, obviously the airplane took off on the bay. It's an, it's an airboat, so it, it floated out on the bay and took off. But the direction of flight towards Tampa the route that it took is what's represented in the current positioning. And all of that was taken into consideration with three-dimensional renderings of the space and moving the, the airboat around in, in that space, then getting feedback from, from board members and committee members and historians. And one of the biggest challenges that we had from a fabrication standpoint was the the base for the piece, the, the chunk of concrete, and the mounting system was all predetermined before the design of the airplane was finalized. So integrating what ended up being uh, the, the pylon that supported it all and that holds it all to the ground in a storm with that predetermined design, um, it, it wasn't a, a natural solution. Once, once we got to actually designing that, we had to integrate it to something that had been de determined previously. So there was a lot of creative problem solving on how to resolve that relationship between the, the airplane and um, the, the component that connects it to the, to the ground. I think one of the things that surprised people was just how big the foundation for the sculpture had to be. Karen's engineering went to great lengths to ensure that this sculpture be as stable as possible regardless of the wind loads that we might experience out here in a storm event. We had played with several ideas about what that foundation might look like. We tried triangles and squares and hexagons and we really felt like at the end of the day just a simple circular element from which the base could be applied to was the most successful. We knew that we wanted the materials to be very durable. We wanted them to feel um, timeless. So anytime that we could use uh, very simple materials that kind of harken back to forms that were being used at that time to kind of bring history forward in, in a modern interpretation, we were able to do that. So for example, because hex pavers were so popular at that time for sidewalks in the city, we actually took the idea of making hex pavers from square porcelain that came from Spain. We had a crazy thing happen where the shipment had actually been dropped at the uh, port. We, we did not know this until it arrived and about 30% of the material had broken. It created a bit of a delay, but it was really worth it because the look, there's nothing like this uh, anywhere. So that was very exciting. We were also able to uh, emulate this idea of a granite curb that you see all over St. Petersburg to this day. We uh, used a modern interpretation of a granite salt and pepper that came from New England. The stone of the seat walls came from Pennsylvania, which harkens back to a relationship with the uh, genesis of design for that Benoit model. And that actually was quarried and used in New England at a residential site and was lifted, cleaned up, cut to size, and brought here. 
So we came up with this idea of just working with the geometry of the site and having these openings in between the seat walls where we actually place the storyboards that tell the story about the historical event. You do get that sense of feeling that there was this strong connection with the airboat on the water and also still maintain that idea that we have a plaza that creates its own place. So by incorporating the wall that tells the name of the plaza and celebrates all of those that volunteered and participated in not only the event, but also those that help make this plaza possible with the placards. And then working with the seat walls, we had um, a beautiful way to create that space. To that extent, our firm came up with the graphic murals of how to arrange the photography and the story on the storyboards. That was very exciting for us, working with the graphic designer and the foundation to be able to tell that story. We actually used fonts that were uh, part of that time that they would have used in the newspaper. So we really did our research to kind of bring that feel into the plaza in whatever way that we could. So most preparation I put into an installation that in, in my uh, experience as a sculptor. So the morning of, we had everything preloaded. So the day before we'd loaded all of the pieces, we had everything ready to go, and we got an escort from the city, and everybody shows up at 6 a.m., and we've got police escorts, and we've got city representatives, and multiple um, vehicles with trailers, and a tractor trailer, and all of these di different parts, and everything is timed. Let me just say, I didn't sleep a lot the night before. Well, my mind was trying to catch up with everything that was going on. Because <laughs> we, we had the, uh, you know, the flatbed trucks coming in with the, uh, uh, the wings, and, and then we had the fuselage, and then we had the, the wave uh, base as well, uh, and then the pedestal that was inside the wave base to really hold the, the plane up. So all of that was uh, arriving and uh, it was being assembled and put together and the crane was taking it off of the trucks and the cameras were rolling and they were interviewing people and then we had our board was showing up and so we were, you know, greeting the board and uh, I mean, it was just, it was like one huge party <laughs> is the way, the way I would put it. It was uh, New Year's Eve <laughs> uh, in uh, early, early December there. We got the first part on, which was that base, and, and all of our bolts dropped right into place, and I knew we were off to a good start. It's like, okay, hurdle number one, we're done. So we get it all leveled out and get all of our bolts tightened, and we go to put the fuselage on next, and it drops right into place, and like a dream, everything's going exactly as planned. In fact, we're about an hour ahead of schedule. So we go to pick up the wings and we get them off and set them down. We get them picked up and we've got them tipped at just the right angle and we're moving everything over. And I've got a dozen crew members all with different responsibilities and we're all communicating. Everything's going smooth and we're about to set the wing and I'm standing on top of the fuselage and the wings are coming over my head. And I realize that we've forgotten to open the hatch. We have an access hatch that is where the engine compartment is and in order to guide everything down as it comes down I actually have to pop up inside those wings and now it's floating there and I've got to deal with this very heavy hatch and keeping everything still and it was one of those moments where it's like man I wish I'd thought through that a little bit better but ultimately we, we got the wings mounted everything went very smoothly and we ended up uh, finishing up over an hour ahead of schedule which was, uh, you know, with these kinds of things, I've, I've seen them go really wrong and this one went really right. When I look back on it now, it's like, God, I'm so glad it's done, but it's, it's something that, you know, no matter the obstacles that we faced, 
we soldiered through as a team and to see it down there on the pier, it has a reward that hasn't dissipated with time, let's put it that way. You know, that's one of those things that it, <laughs> it'll always be there, you know. Uh, welcome uh, you all to the dedication of the world's first airline monument. Happy day! Well, it, it's been a privilege for me to, uh, you know, to be the president of Flight 2014 and to be the kind of the gatekeeper here. But, I, you know, this has been a team effort uh, all along, and uh, we've had a lot of very important quarterbacks. Everybody is a quarterback uh, on this team, and they all uh, contributed in uh, very uh, important ways, and it's just been a joy and a pleasure for me to work with uh, all these uh, folks and local uh, community, the business community, the aviation community. I mean, it's, uh, I've learned a lot uh, myself about how to put together, uh, put together a monument. You know, I've done history books, but this is the first monument that I've done. And it was just like a, uh, a dream come true. I mean, it was just amazing to, to be out there. There was a point that we, we got to that we said, we did it. If Tony Janis were here, he would just absolutely be amazed what uh, aviation has become, especially uh, commercial aviation. But he would also be honored and he would be appreciative of the fact that uh, we recognize that the world's first airline began here and that he had a central part in its organization. Now I say, wow. <laughs>